I can see you. I was, uh, <laughs> Hello. I, was, I was I was just um giving a little account of the weather in France while we waited for you. But I'm so sorry oh, I was a bit late. Oh, honestly. You look fantastic, Lisa. <laughs> you look like, you're like running or something. You're so you look so fit and toned. Oh no, honestly, I'm I'm the, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. It's just a good light. It's a nice soft <laughs> flashing from my from my balcony. Um, yes. You have oh, I'm one so of those setups like um, Claire McIntosh has got, and I saw a photo of her, and she had like a home studio with like a big kind of you know what do I mean micro microphone and like proper. Oh. Light. Oh no, I did do a, a live thing with her and it was very, very um, beautifully set out, but I couldn't see any microphones or anything. It doesn't <laughs> well, it would have been out of shot. But... She's the most professional author in the, in yeah, the country. She is. Yeah. yeah, I think she puts us all to shame, but she, and she's so lovely. She doesn't mean to do that, but there, she is an incredible inspiration with her professionalism. Wow. She's yes. um, she's raised the bar, hasn't she? You know what? I I'm can't even. Look, I can't look at Claire Mac Macintosh's bar. If I look at Claire Macintosh's <laughs> bar, I get really, really stressed and think, "Oh my God, I'm doing everything wrong. I'm a rubbish author." So I don't even. Look at <laughs> we can't argue with number one New York Times bestseller. Congratulations! Thank Honestly, you. I had a tear in my eye when I saw that because it's not even your latest book, is it? What's going you know, on? Would you like would you like to hear the story of how yeah. I've become the number one New York Times bestselling author? Yes. Um, so that was then she was gone, which, you know, in the UK, I think, came out four years ago in hardback, came out three years ago in hardback in America, came out two years ago in in paperback in America, kind of dipped its toe in and out of the top 15 when it on, on publication. And we were like, oh, it made it to number 12 or whatever. And we all got terribly excited. Amazing. And then it disappeared again for months and months and months. Um, it was still selling, um, but very, very slowly behind the scenes. And then at the beginning of lockdown, a real housewife of Beverly Hills posted it on her Instagram feed. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. A real housewife um, posted about it. Which and it one? just... Not that I know who they are, but presumably a very Kyle popular Richards. one whose book choices are highly regarded. Kyle Richards. I love her. I love her. She she bounced my ancient old book from the shadows back into the top 10. And then it just sort of sat in the top 10 for a few weeks. And then it got to number three. And then it got to number two. And then suddenly That's it was... It, incredible. Have you know. sent her some really over-the-top flowers to say thank well, you? Well, I... I would have liked to have done that, except it was during lockdown, and I thought I'd have to send them to her house, and I wasn't entirely sure she'd give me her address. <laughs> I sent lots of flower emojis on my thank you oh, to her. That's um, an incredible story and kind of scary, isn't it, to think of the power now, yeah. the, the, the powerful people in, in all our worlds are not the same ones that used to be powerful. You know, the sort of no. Times critics are no longer the ones who wield I power in the same way. I about to say that we'd be hanging on for our broadsheet review thinking if i get that broadsheet review i'm gonna be a bestseller and now we're hanging on for you know instagram influencers to yeah. notice us and, uh, yeah Even so though i can barely operate the app myself but so no. I, i'm just so happy that that we're doing this and that we've both finally been able to to beat the gremlins and see us see ourselves on screen <laughs> I'm pretty much sure it was all my fault, Louise. I think I, I have no idea from Instagram on computers. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, yeah, we're, we're very old, Louise, aren't we? We are, and your publicist has been too busy helping me today because she's been. I've had to call her and ask her advice about buttons to click. But anyway, that's not what um, what the readers and the lovely Waterstones followers want to want to hear about. And I'm supposed to say repeatedly. Um, that our books are available in signed copy form at Waterstones. And that is actually um, more of a big deal than it sounds because we've signed them in lockdown, haven't we? Which was no mean feat. Yes, it's like a little miracle, isn't it? It's like, how did they do that? It's like, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, no, they are. They're, they're out there in the shops at the moment. Um, they're like sort of Willy Wonka's golden tickets, maybe in a way. Um, have to go and are, see do you, do you have them. readers who literally sort of um, start the book at midnight and finish it at 6 a.m.? Yes, do you? No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> but I thought well, I might, because having done events together, I know you have super fans who come to, come to all of your events. And I think that um, 
you know, once midnight strikes, a bit like a Harry Potter, that Lisa Jewel will be, be, be begun. Yes, well, my social media feed suggests that there were a lot of people who, yeah, literally just sort of snatched it out of the Amazon <laughs> delivery driver's hands and <laughs> all the water stones, all the postman's phone delivery and just, yeah, they, they didn't pause for breath. So, I did yes. enjoy it so much. It was, it's, it was wonderful. I read, cause I had, I read it um, on my laptop and so I didn't read it as quickly as I would have done if it had been in print form because I'm, I'm a terrible reader on laptops. And, um, but yeah. once I started it, I was, I was at that laptop until I finished it. So real wonderful page turn. Well, I, I, take always a massive I take that as a massive compliment because I cannot read on the screen at all. And it's I've been a bit- hard, isn't it? Yeah, really, really hard. I haven't done it. And I feel really awful, you know, when, when I've been offered interesting books to read and like, have you got a paper one? Sorry, we haven't got a paper one. Oh, feeling really bad turning down. So I'm very, very honoured and grateful. <laughs> I don't ever... read very many books in that form. But yeah, so um, I, 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 as soon as I started, oh, oh my God, it was so good. And I love, I don't know whether I'm supposed to have reacted like this, but I really, really loved Owen. Oh, yes. Is it okay oh. to love Owen, even when we thought he was an incel? Which is I didn't even know what an incel was. Yes, very few people knew what an incel was, which is why I very, very helpfully put in the Wikipedia definition. <laughs> of just, for, just for those who, who weren't aware of... Should we, should we talk about Owen? Yeah, shall we? Yeah, and yeah. about incel, if you don't mind that yeah. I've given away the fact. So, so, I think, yes. so we're talking about Invisible Girl, obviously, um, and every time I try and explain Invisible Girl, I get tied up in knots because it's so blooming complicated and there's so much going on in it. Um, so I found it's easier if I just talk about Owen, um, because yeah. Owen is the character who I originally wanted to write the, the novel about. Uh, he was a guy I saw a couple of winters ago walking through a snowstorm uh, in North London, uh, um, just as the schools were coming out and there were children throwing snowballs around and he just looked horrified to be surrounded by all these brats throwing snowballs. And he just had this look about him. He's in his early 30s and he just had this look about him of a man who nothing nice had ever happened to him. No one had ever loved him. He just, he looked lugubrious and heavy hearted and, and possibly a little dark, which grabbed my attention. And I just thought I'd like to write about a guy like that. And in fact, the working title for the book was Creep. Because what I essentially wanted to do was write about a creepy guy. I love <laughs> that title. That's a great title. Maybe one yeah. of your foreign publishers could call it Creep. Yes, maybe someone could snap snap that up because it is it is a good title, isn't it? It's really good. Um, yeah. So because it what well, yes yeah, so and I just wanted to get inside the head of this guy or any guy like him, one of those guys who gets overlooked by women, and you could. Uh, you could start off with innocuously describing him as the sort of guy who's unlucky in love. But I think you have read the book, you would say it's, it's once you get into incel territory, so an incel is an involuntary celibate. Um, and it's a type of man who does not, a type of man who doesn't get lucky. Um, a type of man who possibly has never had a girlfriend, a type of man who, Across the street and the sort of all the body language changes when they're around them for whatever reason. Um, and instead of thinking that they're unlucky enough, they think that the whole of society is geared against them and that there's, they're oppressed. They think they're an oppressed minority and therefore it's open to politicization and radicalizing as well. So yeah. these rooms where they all are. Um, hotbeds for radicalization and and back terrorists terrorist acts of terrorism have come from these forms of oh really oh how awful so there's a yeah, link between misogyny uh, and and death. terrorism and just hate crime exactly because that's saying once you put yourself into um an organization like that then you immediately develop a hierarchy so instead of just being that loser dweeb around the corner that can't get a girlfriend, you're, you're a big a big voice in this forum. Mm -hmm. and, and then it becomes, you sort of legitimize the way you feel. Um, so suddenly, rather than just sitting at home feeling really hard done by because you haven't had a girlfriend, you're in this environment where you think, hold on, it's not on that I haven't had a girlfriend. Someone's gonna have to pay for the fact that I haven't had a girlfriend. Yeah. And people are egging you on and telling you that the world's against you. 
And then you buy a, a gun and you go and shoot up a load of people. Um, not, not in this country, obviously. But yes, so that is... Having said so all that... All of this popped into your mind when you saw some guy walking down the hill and there is, um, there is a scene in the book and it did make me laugh because he, he sees the mums, doesn't he? And, he? and he describes them as having their anoraks with the fur hoods. And he said, what, what are they going to do when they get home and they have their massive glass of white wine? And it was just so perfectly, sort of a perfect sort of observation that someone might have of those handsome well, mums. Me, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know when people ask you if, it's ever you if you ever put your own opinions and, and thoughts into your characters. So that's possibly a thought that might have crossed my no, mind. Definitely. On, I mean, on I, um, I, I'm... Quite a lot of my the sort of more hateful um, characteristics in in my characters are self criticism. I think. I mean, it's a great outlet, um, isn't it? Without us actually saying it into somebody else's head and just yeah. sort of. <laughs> all... <laughs> no, it doesn't do me. I've never had such an evil thought. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's so, a wonderful character. The other passenger. Well, it came out in, was it paperback or hardback? Hardback, a couple of weeks ago. Well, actually, no, it must be six weeks now because it came out on the 25th of June. Yeah, came out in hardback. And, yeah. And, and is it coming out in America? Yes, it yes. is. But um, there's a few changes happening in America, which I can't really talk about, but um, it, it will be coming out late. So it's coming out next summer now. Um, oh, wow. So at the moment, just out in the UK and... Um, yeah, it was. It felt like a, a lockdown, you know, sort of publishing into the abyss in a way, um, yeah. but nowhere near as hard as I think it was for authors whose books were coming out in, you know, April, and you know, it was too late to make make a change to pub date, and I think that was yeah. tough. And it was great that there was so much support for everyone. Um, yes. authors like David Nichols were, um, you know, really going out of their way um, to to help support the the lockdown launches. Yeah. Um, yes. So in a way, I just I couldn't really get a sense of um, of, of it because I haven't even seen it on a shelf. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've seen yours on. Like, I mean, now things are open, aren't they? And so it probably feels a bit more like a normal launch, but without yeah. the party. It does feel more like a normal launch. Um, and I did actually have a nice little lunch with my publishing team, and oh, I did go into great. and I did go into Waterstones today, and I did see it on a shelf. If Waterstones are listening, not quite as many copies as I would have liked to have seen. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I've, it was because it, it, already they, it must have already sold several copies. Sold out. That's clearly what's, clearly what's happened. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so well, I very much had that feeling at the beginning of lockdown, that absolute heartbreaking pain for authors, particularly debut authors, mm. um, and also authors who were launching a big book. And I don't know if, if yes. people... Would, People might, might not understand the concept of a big book, but a big book is a book where everybody at the publishers has a strong sense that this is the one that could fly. So the publishers put everything behind it because it's got that smell about it. Yeah. Um, and there might, be, and there might be poster poster campaign booked that became, that, I guess, sort of not worth the paper it was printed on because no one was on the trains or the tubes. Yes, and they happen to very quickly swap over print advertising campaigns onto online advertising campaigns. And yes, yeah, so it was a really painful time for a lot of authors. And I just remember sitting there thinking, feeling really guilty that I was being published in authors. Just thinking, oh, yeah, I've, I've lucked out a bit here. So, um, yeah. Oh, well, I mean, there's winners and losers in every situation. I just feel grateful that we've still got an industry. And it was, you know, it was heartwarming, wasn't it? Just to sort of see how book sales did pretty well in um, deep lockdown and people were rediscovering reading and, yeah. um, and obviously you know the Waterstones um, throng here now of dedicated readers in you know in all climates but for a lot of people they hadn't read for years and, yes. and suddenly started reading again and I just found that wonderful like a revolution. I and not just reading but binge reading in the way that people have got used to binge watching TV um, I felt that that suddenly started happening to, to, to readers who were fi finding that, you know, how a lot of people say, oh, I don't read, I, I don't have time to read. And suddenly they had time to read and love the yeah. weather. And, and, and for yes, us, because we've, we've published so many novels, haven't we? You've, you've published 18 and I've got 14. And I've had um, readers get in touch and say that they read Our House or they read The Other Passenger and now they're reading all the others. And it's... There's no way if you were, you know, commuting and living a full normal life that you could just oh. take six weeks off and read someone's whole backlist with no other thoughts in, you know, in your mind. 
So exactly. it's, been, it's been good for us in a way, hasn't it? it has. um, winners, I think winners and losers definitely during lockdown. But you're right, in terms of industries as well, I think publishing has been quite protected from the worst the worst of so, yeah and of course you know we've got audio is um is booming isn't it and i don't know who does who's who's um done the audio for invisible girl have you used have you used multiple narrators yes. I've, got, I've got three actors so i've got the, the three main characters are called kate owen and um sapphire and each each character has their own actor narrating their parts, which is um, I've never I've never listened to an audio book, uh, not, not neither my own nor anybody else's. So <laughs> I don't know. I know there's lots of audio fans out there, and I don't know if that makes it a more interesting experience when you're listening to an audio book. Do you listen to audio? I think some books are improved by um, in their audio version. Um, I think it really depends on um, on the actor and the actors. Um, right. because, um, I mean, I have to say that um, while I urge everyone to to try the other passenger in the Waterstones hardback, you might also want to listen to the audio bit because it's read by Stephen McIntosh. And this is another sort of, you know, slight silver lining of lockdown that big actors became available to do um to do audiobooks normally they'd be on set wouldn't they but the sets are all closed and I think yeah. he has improved it I think he has made it sound like a classic book because he is That's so fantastic. good and so you might get that experience but equally with an audiobook I think you might get um you know you might get a, a lesser experience so as with the printed word it varies doesn't it the other passenger is all told from one point of view isn't it yeah yes yeah. Um, so it would make sense to have just the, the just clearly one the one. And slightly <laughs> creepily, yeah, slightly creepily, I did actually imagine Steve McIntosh as Jamie, the narrator, because wow. I love him and um, I always imagine him being cast um, as one of my middle aged, my jaded middle aged men. Um, and so yeah, it was a like dream them. come true. You made it happen. You brought yes. it. Into so tell, tell, tell me, remind me about your book, Louise. <laughs> Which you gave tell, a lovely quote about your book. Oh. oh, well, it, honestly, well, you know, you know, when you get asked which other writers do you read in interviews, and are the, 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 always Louise Candler. You, I mean, you're you are auto buy auto buy novelist yeah well without... i feel the same it's, oh. it's so great and i always love all of yours but i think both of us um are often trying to do something different each time aren't we so i never quite know what to expect and i and and with my own readers i always say you know this is this isn't like the last one and so this isn't like the last one this is um this was very inspired by um 1940s noir movies and um although it's set in the present day it's set in 2019 um, it's got that kind of deception and double crossing um, theme running through it. It's it's a very small cast of characters, just two couples, um, and there's a bit of generational conflict going on there. There's the middle aged couple Jamie, the Steve McIntosh figure, and his partner Claire, and then the younger couple Kit and Melia. And um, it's set on the river boats, on the um, the commuter bus river buses that go up and down the Thames. So I don't know if you've ever taken one. Lisa, yeah. They, yeah they're so great they used to be called Thames Clippers and in the last month they're now rebranded as Uber boats or something so they've, they've got bars on them that sell yeah, alcohol I know. yeah I mean, it's perfect. just as soon as, yeah. alcohol <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's a very posh way of commuting and I yeah. have wanted to write a commuter thriller because I love observing commuters I love the kind of those brief and quite superficial friendships that can crop up with regular commuters you know where um you know you might always try and get the same seat opposite the same person or you know kind of half friends and and maybe go for drinks every so often but i didn't want to do a train because of course we've had girl on the train and we've had a lot of train books um and then one day i was on a thames clipper and it just occurred to me that you know the solution was staring itself in my face and it just um, really was a great discovery because I felt like it helped with the mood and um, just that whole kind of veneer of glamour that you get with a river cruise and as you say the bar you've got your G&T you've got you know icons of London you know sort of gliding by 
Um, but actually, it's quite a dangerous place because if you, you know if you tip into the water, you've got no chance of survival. Um, yeah. And so I love that tension on the river between the the glamour and the you know the deadly reality. So, so, yeah, so then I was away. Tell us what happens between the, these two couples who become friendly on the what's the What's the thriller aspect? Well, the thriller aspect is that something murderous occurs. Um, when in the, in the opening scene, Jamie is taking his regular commute, um, and normally he has his young friend Kit by his side, but Kit hasn't turned up for the boat, and and you know Jamie's speculating as to why that might be. And when he gets off at his stop at Westminster, um, he's met by the police, and they tell him that Kit's actually been reported missing by his wife Melia. And, um, and Jamie is thought to be the last person who saw him, the last person he was seen with, not only that, but at the time they were arguing. And so clearly Jamie is, um, you know, under suspicion here. Um, and so we've got a missing person right at the beginning and we go back and we discover the history of the relationship between these two couples and the, um, the intense envy that developed on the part of one couple towards the other couple. Um, and I won't give too much more away, but um, there is a death and um, there's very, very bad behaviour. And punishment is meted out by, by the author, but <laughs> yeah. not everyone gets their just desserts, I think yeah. I'll, I'll say. No, but, but Jamie, Jamie was that? amazing. Jamie was amazing because oh, he, was, he was such a git. He was such a... <laughs> But you couldn't help be find him an attractive person and just want to be with him. And, and you totally understood um, how various other characters in the narrative responded to the way they did to him. Um, yeah, he, he, was, he was so, he, you know, he's that guy. We've all met that guy. You think, I shouldn't like you, but I do. And I don't know why. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I think that, you know, his... His, at, the, at the beginning of the book, his greatest sin really is just complacency. And, you know, that's not really yeah. something that you go to prison for. It's the just, a, a, just an, a, an unattractive characteristic <laughs> in a middle-aged person who's got yeah. quite a lot of assets and got quite a lot yeah. going for him. But by the end, he has spiralled into something, you know, far worse. And I yes. love that idea of, of people making mistakes and, you know, just falling in with the wrong friend and the bad influence. And you know, the suggestion that's made that they really should just, you know, reject instantly. And the reader knows that, you know, they shouldn't take that path. But of course they do because it's a novel and it's really fun to follow what happens. But no, yeah. he was, uh, I, I think I, it's um, probably the case that he was the um, easiest narrator I've ever written. It felt very I natural. Tell, I could tell. You, you were him. You were completely Yeah, I think so. Him. I'm obviously a horrible, complacent person myself. <laughs> <laughs> just looking for a crime to get involved in. <laughs> <laughs> so who did you sympathise with as you with with your three narrators? Did you sympathise yeah. with Kate or I sensed your love for Sapphire, who I loved also? Yes, yeah, so Sapphire is one of those if you for people who are interested in the way that these books that look like we knew what we were doing while we were writing them came to came to evolve. <laughs> well, literally, the story I was only going to tell it from the point of view of Kate and Owen and Owen is my creep and Kate is this slightly neurotic housewife who lives in the flat or, or, over the street from him who thinks he's a bit of a creep and her daughter thinks that he followed her home from the tube station um, and her marriage is a bit creaky and there's something that happened last year in her marriage to her husband that's left her feeling very much like she has no claim to the moral high ground. She did something un un unforgivable the, the, the previous year. Um, and so I was just going to tell the story. I wasn't quite sure. There are sex attacks going on in this area. Where they live. And I wanted, I wanted it to be one of those situations where everybody looks at the creepy guy and finds a way to make mm. him fit. Um, but... So it was going to be more of a general, there's something going on in this area and, you know, who's responsible for it. And then there's a, a chapter very early on when I talk at her husband, Kate's husband, Rowan, is a child psychologist. And um, she talks about finding a file on one of his patients the previous year, who is this, um, at the time, 15 year old girl called Sapphire Maddox, who's very badly psychologically damaged by something that happened to her when she was 10 years old. And it's just supposed to be a throwaway just 
a line, a nothing, a nobody. You know those names that you make yeah. up? Yeah. One line in a book and you never come back to them. But it just, I suddenly thought, oh, who is this Saffron? And what happened to her when she was 10? And what was her relationship like with Rowan when he was her therapist? And I just suddenly found myself adding this extra character into the mix. So that's where Sapphire came from. She kind of threw herself at me, that you will write about to me. Um, She's so... got a great voice and she opens the book as well. And I always, you know, there, there's always something special about the character that opens the book and you're with them right from the start. She's very intriguing. And we follow her, um, her, her strand before something happens to her. It's so yeah. hard to talk about the books, isn't it? Without isn't it? <laughs> giving away the plot. It's a nightmare. And I loved her. I thought she was, I think you're so good at writing teenagers and you obviously have so much effect. I know that we have, we both have teenagers and um, they're so wonderful to write and so wonderful to read. So I don't know about you, but I have no interest in reading about younger children or mm -hmm. writing their voices because it's no, too no. simple and they're great as plot devices and, you know, yeah. there's some jeopardy because, you know, I can't find my son or, or something like that or they're real even just um, to point out teenagers the sort of can be family. real people can't they yes um yeah so teenagers are um they're, they're, i have been parenting now for 17 years and this is i've got a 13 and a 17 year old daughter and this is by far my favorite bit so far i absolutely yeah. I love, I, and and my daughters are really really not very nice you know <laughs> They don't make it their business to make my life easy or to be pleasant to me no. at all. No, they're classic. They're classic teenage girls. Everything's my fault. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're very demanding and they come they and they go. go they... What, you mean they don't go around empathising very much? They do not How do unusual. that. No. <laughs> but I love it. I absolutely love every minute of parenting them. I mean, it just it's. A, I was talking, I was being interviewed the other day by someone who had a, a nine and a seven year old and was saying, oh, you know, I've been told I've got to enjoy these days while well, they still you know, be around me and everything. And I said, I wouldn't go back to that for anything. I would I have no interest in having a seven and a nine year old. <laughs> no, no, I um, agree. I think teenagers are much more fascinating. And you, um, they're, I mean, they're, they're much funnier, they're, they're, they're often brainier than we are, so they're very clever, they're witty. Yeah. Um, and dark, and they're, just... they're dark, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are dark, yeah. Yes. I mean, you think about their lives, I mean, come on, you know, what they're exposed to and what they consume compared with what we had in the 80s. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, they, they watch really dark stuff that I just don't think we would have been allowed to watch because it would have had an X rating or whatever it was called. Yeah, well, to have, like, smuggled into a cinema under someone's coat to see. Yeah. <laughs> so they can just sort of, you know, when they go on a sleepover and just sort of sneak it onto the laptop when, when the mum thinks they're playing Fortnite or something. Yeah, uh, yeah they have so, so much access to so much stuff. Um, it's really sophisticated as well. So if you you know if you think of a series like um, Sex Education, you know that's really sophisticated and clever. And I can't even imagine what our equivalent was. Charlie um, Angels, or I mean, I just don't know. There was nothing. I mean, the the two the two sex scenes I remember seeing as a child was one in. It wasn't even a sex scene in Charlie's Angels. Somebody touched her bra. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never forgotten that. And then there was Ryan's daughter. Do you remember? <laughs> yes. But yes, that was it. It was some, some, a Charlie's Angel had her bra touched in an underground <laughs> park. Um, but yes, my, my 13 year old has watched every episode of, um, of uh, Sex Education and Skins. Um, and there's another one in between I can't remember the name of, um, as, as well as obviously just other stuff that's not even designed yeah. to you. Yeah, forever. no, it's um, it is extraordinary watching them sort of navigate all that stuff, and then you know remain fairly decent. I think we hope so. So you didn't have any teenagers in the other passenger? No, there's no there's no kids in the other passenger. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write about. No Was that a deliberate choice? Sorry, that's a deliberate choice not to write about children. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because our house and those people were family novels. Um, set in family houses in in family neighborhoods and I just wanted something completely different and so I I have my older couple as a, as child free they've chosen not to have kids 
and the younger couple are you know sort of haven't they couldn't afford to have kids even if they wanted to which they don't want to because they're too busy partying and doing drugs yeah. still and yeah. trying to think of get rich quick schemes um yeah no it was a deliberate choice um, I have written about teens before and I do, I do love um, writing teenage characters, but I really fancied uh, um, a child free zone for a while. And it was great. It was great just to do a kind of heartless, old fashioned, um, double crossing story. Yeah. And so um, I assume you're writing something else now, are you? Yes, I am. I'm writing next year's release. I assume you are too. In fact, should yes, we well, finish how, how, many <laughs> how many words have you written? How many words have you written? Oh, well, I've written 80,000 words. Well, that's nearly a whole book. It's nearly a whole book. Um, I yeah. wouldn't say that they're, they're great yet. Just aware that some of some of the publishing team might be might be watching this the deadline is the end of august so um i've got a hell so of a be on holiday so um let's see how about you yeah. how yes so i'm forty eight thousand words in but i'm due in december oh that's so we're about, we're about right yes yeah. yeah that's about right and i don't know about you but i have um, multiple drafts i mean mine comes back multiple times so i always feel like the first draft is almost just a a kind of taster of what, what the finished product might be with talented people's help. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to assume that in, in amongst the questions that we're, we're going to be doing some questions from the, yes. from the comments section, aren't we? Am I the point? only person who can see the comments? I can see one. It, it was scrolling, but now it's stopped. Um, yeah. We have got some uh, questions, though, that we were given before, gonna... weren't we? Don't we? Because I'm going to talk about drafts and what have you, because I know that that's the sort of thing that um, people always ask, don't they? They want to know about the, the, the process and uh, yeah. and drafts is quite an interesting part of the process and every author does it differently. Um, do and I'm sure there are um, lots of um, lots of people watching who are writing their first novel and it's it's good to say that um, it doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, you know, a, an agent or an editor who reads your submitted draft will be able to judge it on its potential. It doesn't yeah. have to be the per like the perfect novel that you read between the covers. That's how I, I have a huge amount of work. I have a very good friend who, who've just finished writing a novel before lockdown, her first novel. And I was like, this is it. You have to, now, 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 now. All the agents are at home. They've got nothing else to do. They've got these weeks and weeks ahead of them. <laughs> I love um, that. Really, really really that. Um, and, and so every time I spoke to her, I said, did you send it out? Yeah, she said, oh, no, I'm not, I haven't finished. I just wanted to have another read through. I just wanted to polish this up. I just wanted to change that. And I was just like, no, don't. It's brilliant. I've read it. It's amazing. Just send it. It doesn't have to be perfect. They're yeah. not looking for a perfect novel. In fact, they almost want the opportunity to have some input and shape it in a, in a, in a way um, to, to the market. So, I, yes. I agree. And sort of polishing it in terms of the phrase making, it's yeah. probably not worth doing that at this stage anyway, because, you know, as we both know, once professional editors and agents get their hands on your, on your work, you know, that subplots might disappear, characters yeah. might disappear, lots of new things might enter the mix and um you know major rewrites and so there's no point really perfecting every phrase when that might that scene might might go exactly uh, yes, so I think getting the, yeah getting the shape of the book and getting the idea you know so an agent and an editor can see what that central idea is and whether or not you can handle a character and you know get, get some suspense and pace going yes and also you've created a world that they know is a world that readers are going to want to be a part of and it doesn't have to be a perfect world um and i think that's what happened my friend did get an agent by the way she finally sent it and that's she got, so brilliant she got a lockdown agent um oh oh no what have i done to myself i'm trying to look at these that was questions. great advice then that was yes let me see yes. write my sto write my story lisa it's really inspirational Right, your own story. <laughs> I don't know if that's sound rude, but absolutely. I have so many people who say, I've got this amazing story. Will you write it for me? And it's just like, why would you not want to write it yourself? How much of the manuscript did you first send out to agents? Um, well, in my case, um, my first book was published in 2004. And so at that time, I don't know if it's still the same. I think it is, but you were, you were expected to send three chapters. Is that what you did, Lisa? 
Correct. Yeah. I, th and I think that is still the case. I think that's what my friend did. So I'm assuming right. that's okay. Yeah. So yeah. you need something to happen in the first three chapters. You need, or you need a powerful voice already established. You need, you need that agent to really want chapter four. That's the effect you need to, to try and um, achieve in your, in your first three chapters. And then I, th I don't know whether agents now like a synopsis as well, but that's, that's quite good to, um, you know, to show that you know how you're going to handle the, the whole plot. Um, so what my friend did, which I thought was quite clever, was she sent a brief synopsis that she did, she, she did the too long didn't read synopsis, which was like about a page and a half, and then she also sent a shorter one, so the agent could pick and choose which synopsis they wanted to read, which I thought was quite oh, She was yeah. really well advised. Yeah, I didn't tell her to do that, that was her own genius. <laughs> I think that's probably quite a good idea, so... But yeah. that's exciting. So the next part of the process then for her is the, the, the age, working with the agent and then submitting to editors. That's that, yes, which is exactly what would have happened to us back, back in the, the, the early days of our career. And that's pretty much the most exciting bit, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if you, um, we both um, have agents at Curtis Brown, for those who might not know and Curtis Brown runs a creative writing course and I have been a couple of times to talk to students and I would imagine you have Lisa have you with Johnny have you been to I've and, um, and I, I, I always say oh um, you know enjoy this bit because when it's all ahead of you and you've got those dreams nothing is as intoxicating as that feeling not even the news that you've got your first book deal is as good as imagining what it's going to be like to be a professional writer because our yes. imaginations are so powerful that we you know we do a better job than than yeah. reality <laughs> exactly no that is very good advice how much um, that, oh, that whizzed by um something about time frames if someone's asking about time frames that's the bane of my life time frames don't know about you lisa but we've both done recently we've done quite complicated books with with two or three time frames within them haven't we and oh my god it is sometimes it feels like wrangling octopuses or you know doing a doing a jigsaw blindfolded where you can just sort of feel yeah. the edges and you're not quite sure quite where it will fit and so there's yeah. a huge amount of um of finessing with time frames um, yes yes that's the only time i actually because i don't i don't plan I, I don't use notebooks or anything because i don't plan the only time i ever put pen to paper is when i'm trying to iron out my timelines um and quite quite an a helpful thing to do is to give every one of your characters a birthday right at the beginning. Oh, um, yes, that's a good idea because otherwise, yes, no, that is a good idea. I'm going to adopt that. That can be quite helpful if you're writing over an expanse of time. Um, and yeah, so I, I do that now. Um, and also, even if you're not planning on using chapter headings, to put the date at the top of a chapter as you're writing it. So when you go back, you can think, oh, that happened on Wednesday the 25th. Um, when got that date there um but yes it's and then of course we have copy editors who come to the rescue at the last minute and i, I can't imagine what the copy editor's brain must be like that they can read somebody else's book and somehow manage to work out that that couldn't have happened on christmas eve yeah. last year it was on a thursday so that must have been christmas day that, those sorts of things um so yeah, thank you absolutely it's um i think that they must I think a copy editor must take take the manuscript and start their own timeline from yeah. line one yeah. and just track it, yeah. not not accepting our full sense of security at all, but yes. just starting from scratch like a detective. Um, yeah. But yes, I I always have multiple um, revisions to make at that stage yeah. to do with times and where things are and where cars are and where people are. And the um, season. You know, yeah. Yes, indeed. Good question. What else have we got? Lisa, how do I pu publish my book? Well, I think we aren't just answered that, possibly. Yeah. What, ooh, hang on. Yeah. Which one of your books would you like to see on the big screen or TV? You've got a few, well, we've both got a few under option, haven't we? Have you got anything progressing, Lisa, at the moment? Uh, one, I've got four under option, um, all in Hollywood for miniseries. Um, so none of them are under option to be a movie, which is an interesting sign of the times. Yeah. Uh, 
getting closest, but it's still very much in early doors, is uh, watching you. So, oh, interesting. Is that the one that was set in Bristol? Was it set yes. in Bristol? Yeah. Yes. How about you? Um, three are under option. One, one is um, a movie, which I, I would love to happen, um, and the other two TV. But the one is very, very recent. Our house is the closest, I think, and that's sort of at the script editing stage. Um, so nothing, nothing too, um, too progressed. And again, I do feel for, um, you know, the teams and the authors who were about to start filming yeah. and, you know, everything just had to stop, didn't it, suddenly in March. And I think... And then now, yeah. when you come back, you don't necessarily have the same... Yeah, yeah, I think... You can't just have the same actors, the same cast, the same team, the same... No, location right yeah and i think now there'll be you know there's always been a funnel hasn't there of you know more books far more books being optioned than actually you know get made go into production and i would imagine yeah. that that will only only increase um yeah. so i've always seen it as a you know what a wonderful bonus if it happens um i've never been involved in screenwriting have you yet been involved in in the... i have not yet and neither do i ever have any intention of doing so absolutely it does not appeal to me in the slightest <laughs> i love the fact that there are people out there who will do that for me if it, if it ever got, if it ever comes to that so how, but how so about the authors do though don't they i mean look yeah. at jojo moyes and yeah. it's i mean and david nichols quite a lot of authors do apparently do it brilliantly with their first attempt and it's yeah. so cool but i'm exactly like you I think, um, you know, I haven't perfected the novel yet. So the idea that I could, you know, do a great job at a craft where there are seasoned professionals who right. as you say, are, you know, are willing to do it for us. It's, um, yeah. it's not something that I think if, if um, we also, people may not realise, but we, we produce a novel a year, don't we? And, you know, it's, and when you, in your case, you've got still three books ago, you've got a, a number one in the US, you've still got, duties to the the past few books and it takes up quite a lot of time and so to get involved in screenwriting as well I think we'd have to have an adjustment to the book schedules yes but I think if you really wanted to do it you would find the time wouldn't you that's the thing if you actually had a genuine urge if it was something that was innate but I, it's not yeah. in there I don't have it in me there's no not one I don't I don't either me. no and much as I love watching tv and watching movies and i feel quite visual in the way in the way i think and and write i um i don't i don't feel the urge to to write a screenplay at all no i'm sure that um that will be a great relief to yes <laughs> they always ask me that question don't they the <laughs> when they have their conference call with you and they sort of they they edge that question in very gently because they don't know what you're going to say and they know that if you say I don't want to write the screenplay that their lives are going to be 10 yeah. times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here if you need me. Yeah, yes, I'll be here. Perfect. Exactly. You know where I live. <laughs> How strict are your book schedules? Do you ever struggle with a book a year? Um, well, in, in my case, you know, I have a lovely team who are hugely flexible if, um, if I can't deliver on time. Um, but you know it's still a legally binding contract that we've signed and so I do I do always try and, and deliver you know just about on time um, but you know we wouldn't be punished would we if we were if no. we couldn't manage it it's much better that the book is is good and um, you know in, in the best form that we can get it in rather well, then than rushing something out. Late, isn't there there's late in that some people miss their deadline by sort of a year or two years or three years. And I think when you and I are thinking about delivering late, we're talking about four weeks, aren't we? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Asking for an extra month. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's as far as I've ever pushed it. I've only ever asked for an extra month. And the thing is, they, the publishers give themselves a maximum amount of time between delivery and publishing um, just to, so it's perfect. So if you're a month late, it just means they've got a month yeah. less to do something that it just they means could. the copy editors have got less time to, to exactly but i know that I've, 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 heard, I've heard of novels that have been delivered like two months before publication and they still managed to to get them out on public on publication day so it just makes it easier if there's a lot of leeway um, yeah yeah i mean we're we've done it a lot now and so we kind of 
we know the rhythm of it, don't we? And I can I can always tell if it's going well and if it's going wrong and if I'll need more time. Um, yeah. And so, you know, you do develop a certain amount of professionalism. I think the yeah. only thing I would say is that with um, each of my books, I've usually tried something new structurally. And so I'm never quite sure how easy it's going to be and whether or not it's going to even work. And so it's good to know that, you know, that the team are really um, very understanding. Oh, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> One thing you can say about the publishing industry, everyone's very nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. They're kind and um, hugely helpful. And I think, um, you know, sympathetic to to the um, the plight of yeah. the yeah. The author in front of the laptop thinking, Jesus Christ, is <laughs> ever going to read okay? <sighs> Let me see somewhere if we've got any more questions. I must keep an eye on the time. Simon. What time is it? Oh, I've we've only got, got five minutes left. We oh, are oh. very nice. Have you ever worked on two books oh. at the same time? Oh, that's a really good question, isn't it? Yeah, no, I haven't even touched such a, a, a concept. No, not even got close to doing that. Have you? Well, I have, but only um, recently when I wrote a quick read. Um, have you written a quick read yet, Lisa? No, I get asked every year and every year it doesn't quite sort of... Oh, well, because it, it, it is something that you do have to do in parallel. So, you know, you do have to give yeah. it proper thought, don't you? Yeah, I've seen sure that you, before, you, okay. if you If you do, do you ever yeah. want to do one? But I did do that this year. I did write a quick read. Um, and what I did was I um, just took two months off to do it yeah. rather than trying to do you know monday wednesday and friday on the novel and tuesday and yeah. thursday on the quick read i just compartmentalize them and i think that's yeah. the only way you can do it otherwise you know you your your characters will overlap and you'll then, everything will sort of bleed into each other but then jenny colgan for example is a very good friend of mine um so i'm very familiar with her writing her writing life um, she she will do that. She'll have two or three books sometimes that she's writing concurrently, and and not just different books, but in different genres. So she'll be writing a sci-fi. She writes Doctor Who novels as well, and the romantic comedies, and she'll be writing all three of those books within oh the same book. I <laughs> I can't. So what does she, do you know? What she does then? Does she does she do several different books in one day or would she take it one week each? Yes, yeah, so she's, say she's got three three hours in a coffee shop, she'll spend an hour doing the sci-fi and then two hours doing the romantic comedy in the same writing session. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it makes she must brain. have one of those amazing minds then that can just, um, you know, she, she's probably someone who can speak fluently while hearing someone in her earpiece issuing yes. instructions. She's got a different brain from me, clearly. She can play the piano and speak multiple languages, and she's a bit of a genius. So, yeah, yeah that's probably why. It's easy for her. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, easy, easy for her. Exactly. <laughs> she's got a lot of energy as well. I, we were pub I remember when we were published by the same team and did a few things, and I was really impressed with her energy levels. She's, yes. Um, yeah. She's, yes, she's very, very It's not surprising to hear that she can, she's multi talented. Yes, absolutely. But yes, for most normal people, it would be very, very hard to write two books. Yeah, compared. yeah, no, absolutely. Let's see if there's any more questions coming up for the final few minutes. Um, we did, we were given some, weren't we? And um, let me see if I can find one to ask Lisa on my laptop. Oh, here's a good one. Which do you create first, plot or characters? That's that comes up a lot, and that's an excellent question. Yes, oh, definitely characters. I, I find a person that I want to write about, and then I have to make a story for them. Um, and then the plot, I don't plot before I start writing. I just type chapter one, and I've usually been thinking about this character for so long that I'm kind of chomping at the bit to start being them. Um, and I've given them a sort of starting point. I've got a vague idea of what's going to happen to them in the first two or three chapters. Um, <clears throat> and then and of another character I might introduce at some point, And then I just plot as I go. So I find that, that honestly, my heart's beating really fast. Oh, yeah. oh, you were and also it, it reads in the most tightly, cleverly constructed, interwoven way. So how on earth can that just be I should, shall I, made I, up I, as it goes along? I 
So what I've kind of worked out that I do is I, I'm so I'm fixated on getting these thousand words on, on the page every day that I can live with myself. And, and I don't go backwards. I only write forwards. And whatever I put on the page, my phone's going to power off in 30 seconds. Hold on. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Hold on, I'm plugging myself in. There we go. Ah, right, I'm having to hold myself. <laughs> anyway, um, so I put things on the page and I don't worry about what those things are. And I think I'm going to find a way to make that work later. Later. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I think if I gave myself the leeway to keep going back and changing things and fiddling and going, oh, well, I put that in chapter three and I don't think it really works now, then it might loosen up a bit. But because I've put that in chapter three and I'm determined to make it work, it feels tight. It feels like I've had some sort of control over. <laughs> yeah, which well, obviously works incredibly well, doesn't it? But I mean, that to me, that's um, very free spirited. Oh, that's I'm, me. I am. <laughs> Tell us about your your straight but lace. I do, but I know exactly what you mean. I stopped stop quite loosely, um, but I wouldn't be able to start without having thought about what was going to happen. I think I would just sit there with a blank screen. I don't think that it's that fluent for me. I think I need to know what the story is. I quite often will have the plot before the characters, actually. Um, okay. Yeah, because I'm, it's, I'm always interested in plotting. I feel like it's the, the puzzle is the bit that really interests me. And then the characters will, I'll think, well, what, what, what characters would be involved in that situation? So with our house, for instance, it was the property theft that interested me. And then I, and I wanted to think about a relationship that would where it would, there'd be a maximum betrayal. And so the characters followed the plotting. Um, and then I think the other, the other big thing is um, setting, isn't it? And I don't, do, oh, yeah. does your setting, what, at what yeah, point do you know you've like got the character. setting? Yes, yeah. so the, the setting, the choice of setting comes to me in the same way that the choice of characters comes to me in as much as I want to be a person for a year. I also want to be living in a particular house or in a particular village or in a particular seaside resort i want to be there so that is yeah. very much a, a, a primary consideration before plot as well <laughs> and i know you're all about houses as well aren't you you're massively house obsessed yeah well i have um my my recent books have been set in south london but earlier in my career i did um i, I literally looked at the map and thought where do i want to go where you know where where would be a great setting for this particular yeah. story and i've written lots of books set on islands i know they're hugely popular um, settings for novels because you've got you know that kind of castaway tension and you know that sort of idea that you can live another life on an island. So I must have said what, what was that novel on the Ilde Sorry. Ray? The oh, novel that was, you... that was the um, disappearance of Emily Ma. That was my first Louise Candlish. I oh, love that. It? Oh, yeah. thank you. That was the one that got me into the most trouble because it didn't have an ending, and I've since added an ending. Oh. Um, which um, is quite an unusual thing to do, isn't it? To sort of yeah. add a chapter after the book's been published for several years. Have but you did ever it been, been tempted to do that? Have you ever had a, an ending that's been more of an open ending and people have showered you with requests for what happens next? Yeah, so the Probably family upstairs had very me. much... Family upstairs, it wasn't so much an open ending because that makes it sound unsatisfying and frustrating. And it's not an unsatisfying or frustrating ending. It's no, really not at all. It's not. Ending, it's... But it, it, suggests, it suggests another book, yeah. I would say. Rather than not closing the last book, which is yeah. what girls do, it also suggests another book. So I am going to do that is it. my favourite kind of ending where you get a very clear glimpse of what could happen. Mm -hmm. Ideally something, you know, quite dark and ironic um i love those sorts of endings and then you know you go away with your kind of feeling of you know doom or pleasure or whatever it is mm -hmm. but i i like i love the readers to turn the last page and, and be still thinking about what might happen next but with with mm -hmm. emily marr i think i just took that too far and i did get in trouble but okay. um i won't do that again but you listen, love our is up, um... so i'm wondering if i should if yeah, we should so fun, didn't we? Yeah, I'm so sorry for the questions that we didn't answer, and we can perhaps tomorrow have a look at Instagram and have a look at the Waterstones um, feed and um, and answer some questions um, that we missed. Yes, absolutely. I'll be there. I, I will. I will get on it. And uh, have yeah. you got your book to wave? Have you got Invisible Girl to wave? Such an idiot. 
I've, I've got about a thousand of them on my stairs waiting to be brought up. <laughs> I've got the I've got the American one. Sorry, sorry. Oh, that's lovely. And, um, that's lovely. I've, so I've got a my... fine, just a final word then to say that these books are available signed from Waterstones. And yes. Enjoy. Bye, Louise. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. It's so lovely to catch up. And you. Bye. See you in real life. I hope. <laughs> yes, definitely. Bye. Bye.